We're going to have some comments from Mr. Greg Zanetti. Greg grew up in Albuquerque. He graduated from Valley High School, West Point Military Academy, and earned a master's degree in business. He served in the U.S. Army stateside, Germany, and Guantanamo Bay. His day job has been as a financial planner. A member of the New Mexico National Guard, Greg was promoted to Brigadier General in 2005. And because of a deployment, he had to sell his financial services business. But Greg is the type who always finds a path to success. So get this, when he came back from Guantanamo Bay, he secured a job managing the assets for Bill Gates and other affluent clients. After spending a few years out of state handling the financial matters of lifestyles and the rich and famous, he and his wife, Teresa, came back to New Mexico and Greg started a new firm called Zanetti Financial. Please welcome New Mexico Army National Guard, retired Brigadier General, Greg Zanetti. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, I believe we've been taught in error. From our earliest days, we're taught to view the world through lenses, such as culture, nationality, race, religion, maybe even political party. I've come to believe these lenses are warped, kind of like those mirrors you see at the carnivals. Tonight, I'm going to offer you a different lens. I hope it's a clearer lens. And then at the end of this talk is free men and free women. You can choose to either accept or reject my view of this and realize this is really only one man's opinion. So let's begin. Have you ever met a man who seems to have it all? He may be wealthy or hold a position of power. Perhaps he's handsome. He seems to glide through life effortlessly. Yet there's something about him that makes you uncomfortable. You can't put, quite put your finger on it, but something is off. There's no reason for this feeling. If you know him personally, he's always been nice to you. Still, there seems to be an invisible hand that pushes you away from him. And once out of his orbit, you breathe easier. There's another kind of man. He has neither wealth, power, nor fame. Heads don't turn, people don't whisper when he enters a room. Yet, when he looks you in the eye or he shakes your hand, you think, I like this fellow. Uh, I'd like to spend more time with him. Here, the invisible hand seems to bring you into his orbit. And once there, you breathe easier. The first man I described I will call the hollow man. The second I will call the noble man. In this evening, the hollow man, noble man lens is the lens by which I will ask you to consider viewing the world. And for those of you wondering, why is he using the term man? The answer to that is simple. I'm not a woman, so, <laughs> so I will not presume. <laughs> so let's first examine the hollow man. When you study hollow men, you will see commonalities emerge. Hollow men do many of the same things wrong. Tonight, we'll look at only five. First, the hollow man values money over integrity. Often his wealth is not earned by hard work or enterprise, but rather through cleverness or gaming the system. The tricks are old. He skims a little bit from the many without conscience. He readily bribes or threats others to get pay. He twists and contorts laws to gain unfair advantage. And when his methods are called into question, he will calmly state, it was all done legally, which may be true, but very rarely was it done ethically or honestly. Now, this is not to say, well, all wealthy men are hollow. That paints with too broad a brush. Plus, wealth is a relative thing. The richest man in a poor village can be just as hollow if he has gained his status by dubious means. Now, as the hollow man's wealth increases, he struggles with how to employ it. Initially, he focuses on frivolity and sensual pleasure, but soon he finds power and control are far more satisfying. Thus, his life work, work begins in a never-ending loop of money to power to control all circling back to more money. 
Thus, the first trait of the hollow man is, he is greedy. The second trait of the hollow man is his need to subjugate women. For many hollow men, dominating women is the power they cherish the most. The hollow man does not embrace the idea that two should become one. That would require acknowledging some weakness on his part and some strength on the woman's. Therefore, refusing to become one, he goes through life as a half, and he wonders why he isn't fulfilled. He equates manliness with dominance, and this often manifests in verbal or physical abuse, sometimes both. You will know you're in a culture dominated by hollow men when women are pushed aside as unneeded and with half of the society's talents held captive and oppressed, progress stops. Societies dominated by hollow men first decay, then fossilize, eventually die, unfortunately taking many innocent victims with them. Thus, the hollow man is at best a chauvinist and at worst a misogynist. Third, the hollow man embraces words over action. He values persuasion over truth. He uses words to dazzle those easily impressed. And adoration follows. He likes that. Yet perversely, he, he holds his admirers in contempt. How could they be so foolish to believe my nonsense? Eventually impressing the trusting and the naive bores him. Thus, he seeks higher challenges. The hallowed halls of academia beckon him to the challenge. There he comes to believe man's mind can conquer all. So he seeks to intellectualize everything. Soon his thoughts and philosophies drift away from objective reality. Absolutes no longer exist. All becomes gray. Lies and truth merge. Of course, all of this leads to pessimism and cynicism. And soon his heart becomes stone and his conscience numb. Eventually, Pontius Pilate's rueful lament of what is truth becomes his guiding principle. Nothing is then worth fighting for, and his power to act dies. Thus, the hollow man will not engage in a bar fight even as his wife is being accosted by a drunk, nor will he grasp the sword and shield when the barbarians are at the gate. Thus, the hollow man embraces comforting lies over harder truths. Fourth, the hollow man refuses to take responsibility for his actions. Taking responsibility would require acknowledging fault. Therefore, blame must be directed elsewhere. Yet oddly, the hollow man nurtures his own personal cult of victimhood. He believes he wrongs no one. Yet somehow, he is always wronged. The ubiquitous they are to blame for his unhappiness. His maturity level thus arrested, he easily succumbs to anger and outburst, demanding loyal for others from others, but loyal to no one in return. He's prone to pervert justice, will torture logic and reason to ensure others bear the responsibilities of his sins. Apologies are thus rare, but punishments are swift and sure. Thus, the hollow man is a shirker. And finally, number five. If you are looking for the defining trait in the hollow man, it is this. The hollow man worships himself. He is the arbiter of his own spiritual truth. And since there is no greater authority than he, to question him is tantamount to questioning God. Predictably, what follows is the belief that if there is an eternity, that eternity is devoid of any consequences based on earthly behavior. Thus, untethered by any accountability to a higher power, and absent any eternal consequences, he is now free to do as he pleases. Remarkably, the hollow man often takes on an air, though, of spirituality. He has no compunction about using a Bible quote to make a sale or garner a vote. He may even chant or meditate, all the while ogling the girl in the yoga pants in front of him. But connection to the divine is never his real goal. In fact, the opposite is true. He raises his fist toward God and believes himself emancipated from old and withered superstitions, never seen he himself as imprisoned
by the ancient chains of pride and arrogance. And his so-called <laughs> enlightenment is nothing more than a wormed over promise uttered by a serpent thousands of years ago. Thus, the hollow man substitutes a gauzy spiritual flimflam, really, for the hard work of confession, repentance, and transformation. He trades the eternal for the temporal and sacrifices all things sacred for a bowl of stew or 30 pieces of silver. Sad, really. Sad or not, never forget the hollow man is a dangerous man. And when your family, your community, or your civilization enshrines the hollow man, know this, your fate is sealed. So why Larry lay bare the traits of the hollow man on an evening when we honor heroes? That answer is simple too. To really appreciate the worthy man, the noble man, one must be aware of the alternative. The good news is, just as there are similarities with hollow men, there are similarities for noble men. And as you might guess, noble men tend to do the same things right. So let's look at five. First, the noble man believes he is first and foremost a spiritual being. Yes, he can, it consists of body and mind, and yes, the spirit part is hardest to prove. But to him, it is the most real. He believes there is a creator who placed a divine spark within him. He is therefore accountable to a higher authority. Oh, and there is an eternity. And it can either be very pleasant or very painful. Therefore, the noble man is neither careless with his words nor his actions. He rejects the ever-changing moral and ethical standards of the prevailing cultural zeitgeist. Yes, there are ambiguities in life, but right is right and wrong is wrong. And these standards were written into men's consciousness and into our hearts from the beginning. The noble man understands his place in the universe. He's above the animals, but below the angels. And no, he will never be God. He believes by bending his knee, he somehow becomes taller. By acknowledging weakness, he somehow becomes stronger. Far from perfect, he falters and he falls. His character slips. Still he rises. He vows to remember and not repeat. Theologians call this repentance, and it is integral to the character of the nobleman. Therefore, there's often a hint of sadness to the nobleman. He sees past failings as scars on his soul. In reflective moments, he winces, and he thinks, I wish I would have, or how could I have? He would give nothing more for a do-over, but recognizes if given that chance, <laughs> he would likely just make different mistakes. Thus, the first trait of the noble man is he believes in God. Second, the noble man takes responsibility for his actions. Blaming others is repugnant to him. When he errs, rather than pointing fingers, he places his hand over his heart, acknowledges fault in all that he's done and all that he has failed to do. He believes in the concepts of duty, honor, loyalty. Duty is bearing responsibility for others. Honor is bearing responsibility to higher ideals. And loyalty manifests his responsibility to those in his charge and to God above. Therefore, if anyone kneels before him, he is quick to say, no, arise. And thus, the noble man is accountable. Third, the noble man prefers action to words. It's not that words don't matter, they do. But those who talk too much make him nervous. A man's yes should be yes, his no should be no. Truth and integrity are simple concepts to him. He sees telling a lie as cowardice, for lying is the fear of facing the truth. And though truth is an unbending taskmaster, the noble man believes it is better to submit to truth than to rule over lies. With respect to education, the noble man understands the value of the classroom but also understands there are multiple ways to demonstrate intelligence and mastery. He will readily abandon convention and use whatever is available to overcome an obstacle. Should one, method failed, should one method fail, he will try another. And from his experimentation, genius often results. The noble man also anticipates. 
while others stare at the gathering storm and argue about how big the storm will be, the nobleman quietly rounds up the horses and puts them in the barn. He believes in adventure and discovery. To him, men should know how to ride hard and shoot straight. Quests are to be encouraged, but always for a higher purpose, that being to make life better for those who follow. The noble man does not seek conflict or battle, but has no illusions about the world. He knows most bar fights are won by those who punch first and hardest, and wars are won by spilling the enemy's blood. He lives the old adage, actions speak louder than words, and thus the noble man lives a life of purpose. Fourth, the noble man respects women. Clearly, women have, have strengths he will never possess, and he's not threatened by this obvious fact. When a woman speaks, he listens. He may not always agree, but he seeks to understand. In a perfect world, the words fair and equal would define the male-female relationship. But the world and relationships are complex things, so that ideal is rarely achieved. Still, the noble man has a well-calibrated ethical scale that does not tip unfairly based on X or Y chromosomes. In matters of love, the noble man sees a woman as a beauty to be won. That requires a higher standard of behavior from himself. Now, maintaining that standard can be a challenge as his desire for discovery and quest are not always compatible with refinement and decorum. Still, he is aware and thus slow to anger and quick to apologize. The noble man believes it is his duty to defend women, not because they are weak, but because two becoming one makes sense to him. He believes that he desires not to be a half, and he vows if God is intertwined with the two, then it forms a three-braided cord, not easily broken, and that is worth defending. He understands friction is natural between men and women. He sees this as the way both are strengthened and refined. Love then conflates with patience and kindness, and love becomes neither boastful nor pr or proud. And from this understanding comes an increased capacity to forgive. And by such he believes men and women help each other get to heaven. Thus the noble man trusts women. And finally, money. The noble man values integrity and honor over money and wealth. It's not that he disdains money, he sees it as a tool. He's convinced if he can see how a man spends his money within five minutes, he will tell all about him. Is he buying expensive suits or giving to the poor, casinos or college funds? To the noble man, means should have meaning. He loans money without interest, and he holds no grudges if money is never repaid. Thus, the men and women he admires are those who are the excellent teachers, the dedicated nurses, the able mechanics, the dedicated policemen, and the re retired Marines. Their bank accounts aren't stuffed with digits, but he sees their contributions as having far more value than yachts or jets. In fact, to the nobleman, Excess money leads to selfishness and idleness. Decadence and degeneracy follow, and decadence is at its core a moral and spiritual failing that money reveals but does not cause. Thus, the noble man embodies integrity. So, know this. When your family, your community, your civilization enshrines the noble man, greatness follows, and it is here our comparison ends. So to summarize my case, I do not believe the history of mankind is defined by culture, nationality, race, religion, or political party. The common thread of human history is the struggle between the hollow men who seek to conquer and divide in the horizontal, vying against the noble men who seek to connect and unify in the vertical. But again, this is only one man's opinion. Now, with all of this said, if in some way this all seems a bit unsatisfying, you're not alone, for there is a foundational injustice to my lens. 
It is difficult to watch the hollow succeed while the noble suffer. And it is equally difficult to reconcile while, why hollow lives are often so long and noble lives so often cut short. To those of you who bristle at this injustice, I understand. But please allow me to offer another view. Before I do, though, please know this. For what I'm about to say, there is no empirical evidence. This is merely the movie in my mind. I believe at death. There is the slightest of moments when a man hovers between this world and the next. In that instant, all the truth of a man's life is revealed to him. There's no escaping it. There's no debating it. Rebuttal is not possible. As the hollow man looks down on his, yes, hollow, lifeless, mortal shell, the truth will terrify him. He will think, what have I done? Pride and ego blinded me. I lived only for myself, and now it is too late. Then an all-encompassing blackness will settle down over him, and he will cry out in anguish as he sinks into his just eternity. Inappropriately, his last thoughts will be consistent with his earthly obsession, what will become of me? Conversely, I believe as the noble man hovers between this world and the next, he will think, I hope the people I saved are okay. I shall greatly miss my family. I hope they know I loved them, and I wish I had contributed more. And with this, his mind transfixed on others. The purest of lights will envelop him, and he will feel unimaginable peace, love, and joy. And in a blink, he will find himself in the throne room of heaven. And there, absolute holiness will overwhelm him. Startled by its power, he will do what any noble man would do. He will drop to his knees, he will clasp his hands, and he will bow his head. And then seemingly from nowhere, one wounded hand will reach out and grasp his shoulder. The other wounded hand will be placed gently upon his head, and he will hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my kingdom. My friends, I would now like to ask a favor of you. We have our noble man on the screen here today. We have already acknowledged him. However, I believe if he were here, he would say, the noble men and women that are in your audience are the ones that deserve recognition. Life is for the living. So I'm going to ask a favor of you. When I say, let's hear it for the noble men and women, will you cheer and applaud with this in mind, that perhaps tonight it's possible our appreciation will be heard high above and far above. And maybe from here, this little dot on the globe a connection will be made, and heaven and earth together will rejoice because God blessed us with the noble man and the noble men and women who are sitting at our tables and operating and working in our community today. Will you do that? All right. Ready? Ready? <laughs> <laughs> to the noble men and women! <laughs> Thank you, Greg, for those key keynote comments. We have uh, a certificate for you in recognition of being one of our heroes tonight and also a nice uh, Nambe gift takeaway. Kind of. Thank you very much. Thank you.